On the evening of November 14, 1940, the English city of Coventry was bombed by the German Air Force. Based on that date, you probably surmised that this was a World War II bombing run, but what you might not know is that this particular attack was one of the most intense, concentrated, and devastating of the war within the United Kingdom. Coventry was an industry city filled with factories and assembly lines, most of which were turned to the war effort, repurposed for the moment to produce munitions and such, rather than cars and bikes and commercial airplane engines, as per the usual. As a consequence of that solid infrastructural setup, Coventry was at one point responsible for producing a full 25%, one-fourth of all British aircraft produced in-country during the war. It makes sense, then, that the Germans would choose to bomb this city of around 238,000 people and to bomb it in such a way that it would have trouble rebuilding. Operation Moonlight Sonata was the code name for this particular German Air Force mission, and it involved a novel approach to designating the target bombing area, which involved sending out smaller scout aircraft ahead of the main bombers to drop marker flares and to start fires in the city, lighting up the area so that it could be more easily hit by the higher-flying bombers that came in a short time later. They also deployed a new type of incendiary bombs that were intended to cause more devastation to the structures of the buildings. The combination of magnesium-based and petroleum-based incendiaries allowed the bombers to burn away roofs and then drop high explosives deeper into the skeleton of a building, leaving many of the targets completely leveled rather than just burnt and damaged but reparable. The level of destruction in Coventry after this one night of bombing which involved 515 German bombers alongside the smaller flare-dropping planes, was so intense that Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda, came to use the term Coventried when referring to similar levels of devastation elsewhere later in the war. In all, the bombers dropped around 500 metric tons of high explosives, which included around 50 parachute air mines, which are exactly what they sound like, essentially a naval mine attached to parachutes and dropped on cities, alongside about 36,000 incendiary bombs. And again, the combination of different types of munitions used in this attack led to the creation of a firestorm which absolutely devastated the city. Half of the total housing in the city was destroyed beyond repair, and essentially all of their manufacturing capabilities were destroyed as well. A lot of the academic research about this attack has been in reference to the level of franticness, of hysteria and terror and neurosis that emerged in residence as a consequence of how things went down. Part of the fascination here, I think, is that military leaders are always looking for ways to make their fortifications more resilient. And when it's your cities that are under attack, that means making sure your buildings, but also your people, can survive the attack and can maintain enough psychological fortitude to rebuild and carry on afterward. Londoners and citizens elsewhere throughout the UK are somewhat famous for their so-called blitz mentality, the stern, steady resiliency that they demonstrated in the face of horrible, terrifying conditions during the war. The panic that emerged in Coventry is said to have been in contrast to that, and the relatively quick one-night leveling of their city with that accompanying firestorm is thought to be part of why the two populations responded differently. There's also a theory that because Londoners had a longer drawn-out period of alarm and worry, they had the chance to psychologically adjust to this new worldview and the ever-present potential for danger. And that, combined with a comparatively superficial concern about looking weak in front of strangers. There are far more people in London, after all, and that means any panic or lack of sturdiness that you show will play out in front of strangers. In Coventry, in contrast, the bombing happened with little warning and folks watched entire families die all at once. Families that were their neighbors, people that they were likely to know personally, 
or at least by sight, and because they were more likely to be familiar with the people that they were in the bomb shelters with, the desire to not embarrass oneself in front of strangers was less of a concern. They could bring all that terror right up to the surface, because these were friends and family. That is the theory, at least. And such post hoc assessments of horrible wartime scenarios are interesting both in what they say about the priorities of military minds and the potential for what our governments have learned, or think they've learned, in the meantime, and what that may mean for how they are preparing us today for potential future attacks. Probably the most famous aspect of the Coventry Blitz, though, and of Operation Moon Knight Sonata in particular, is the possibility that Winston Churchill, then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, knew that this attack was going to take place beforehand, and that he decided not to act upon that knowledge so as not to give away his access to information about German activities to the enemy. You may have heard, either in pop culture or in history class, about the Enigma machine that the Germans developed at the end of World War I, and which then evolved in shape, complexity, and variety in the years leading up to World War II. These machines were, in essence, simple computers, simple in that they were not powerful in the way that modern computers are powerful. This was well before the age of the microchip, so they were predicated on very simple electronics paired with mechanical parts. The end result looks something like a typewriter with old-fashioned telephone cables and little spinning pieces attached to it. The purpose of these devices, though, was to give the Germans a more or less unbreakable cipher, a code that would allow them to communicate with each other without the enemy being able to snoop on them and know what they're planning. The German Enigma code was not the only one being used during the war, but it was complex and seemingly foolproof. That's how it seemed, at least, until the Allies, especially the Polish, French, and the British, worked together at Bletchley Park in England to crack that code. Eventually, the English mathematician and computer scientist Alan Turing was brought into that secret program, and he came up with a novel approach to decoding the Enigma, which eventually led to a solution that worked, giving the Allies access to a large percentage of all German messages, which, according to Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower, proved, quote, decisive, end quote, in turning the war in the Allies' favor, allowing them to eventually defeat the Axis powers. There's a film called The Imitation Game that gets into the enigma-breaking aspect of this story, and that's worth checking out, though it's good to remember that, as with all films, it takes quite a few liberties with the truth to create a more evocative on-screen story. That said, I want to take a moment here to address the idea that Churchill may have known about the impending attack on Coventry and allowed it to happen anyway. This is a theory that some historians, including those writing for the BBC, often refer to as a conspiracy theory, claiming that it's faulty and scandalous, but not rooted in truth. Others, though, including folks who worked with Churchill firsthand, and those who had other types of access to this plot as it unfolded, have claimed that this decision wasn't arrived at easily, but it was a decision that happened. Churchill decided to sacrifice the few for the many allowing Coventry to burn and a huge manufacturing resource to be taken off the map in order to keep their breaking of the Enigma code secret so that they could keep tabs on what the Germans were up to and slowly but surely figure out a way to an overall victory rather than just a one-off victory. Both of these stories make a sort of sense. We have a similar story in the United States, also widely contested, but widely believed that then-President Roosevelt allowed the Japanese to bomb Pearl Harbor, despite having forewarning of the attack, because it was the only way to convince the isolationist American people to support a war that he and his administration believed was necessary. The truth, in both cases, is almost certainly a combination of the two extreme claims. It's likely that, as is claimed by some in the non-conspiracy camp, that Churchill was aware of an attack called Moonlight Sonata, but either didn't know where it would be, didn't have any way of stopping it, even if he wanted to, or, as some claim, he actually thought it would be an attack on London, which is where he deployed his forces for the night of the Coventry attack. There's a good amount of evidence to back up that particular middle ground story. Similarly, 
it's quite possible that someone within the United States administration heard rumblings about a possible attack on the Pearl Harbor Navy base. But all official evidence and documentation points at a lack of knowledge, not a conspiracy, leading to the success of that attack. The opposite claim of conspiracy seems to have stemmed primarily from a 46-page booklet that was published by the leader of a non-interventionist group called America First Committee. His name was John T. Flynn, and he believed that the U.S. should avoid any interaction with the world beyond its borders. And in that context, this theory that he published and made popular makes a whole lot of sense, without adding any actual credibility to that theory. He wanted to keep the U.S. out of the war, and turning the Pearl Harbor attack into an attempted casus belli, a justification for war, was one way to counter the government's prevailing narrative. All that said, there's no real way to know who knew what when if you look into this sort of thing. There's a chance that even those who wrote about the events in question contemporaneously had some hidden agenda, or didn't have the information that they claimed they had, or that they were simply cracking from the stress and presenting their own in-situ conspiracy theories. And these mutterings can then be amplified by archivists and historians later when they come across these older accounts, which they can't help but imbue with a hint of credibility due to their historicalness. What I'd like to talk about today is a potential attack, or what might even be a series of attacks, or maybe mistakes, or attacks that look like one thing, but are actually another thing. And it's all happening today, as we speak, documented in the news media. And yet, because of the nature of the offensive, even though we are seeing it happen in real time, we still can't quite parse fact from truth conspiracy from conspiracy theory, credible sources from non-credible sources. Today we'll be talking about a company called Supermicro, a country called China, and the purported big hack. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. From September 2018 until September 2019, I am on tour around North America. If you'd like to come out and hear me speak live, if you'd like to get a hug or a handshake, if you'd like to get a book signed, consider coming out to one of these talks. You can find out more about the tour, you can find a list of dates and cities, and you can pick up your tickets, if you'd care to, at becomingtour.com. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to unspool today comes from Bloomberg Business Week, and it's entitled The Big Hack, How China Used a Tiny Chip to Infiltrate U.S. Companies. And the subheader reads, The attack by Chinese spies reached almost 30 U.S. companies, including Amazon and Apple, by compromising America's technology supply chain, according to extensive interviews with government and corporate sources. Now, if that subheader sounds a little bit defensive, there's a reason for that tone, which we'll get into in a few minutes. To start, though, let's outline what this story, which there's a good chance you at least heard something about, even if only in passing, is actually about. This piece of investigative journalism lays out a scenario in which Amazon, back in 2015, was thinking of acquiring a company called Elemental Technologies which had developed video compression software they thought might be useful for their Amazon Prime video service. Elemental also did business with the U.S. government, which did not hurt their acquisition odds. Amazon provides their AWS services to the CIA, among other high-end privacy-focused entities, so that this potential acquisition had already been cleared for government contracts was a feather in their cap. But during the due diligence phase, the third party doing the investigation discovered that the servers being used by Elemental included a very small chip that shouldn't have been there. And this chip is described as being smaller than a grain of rice and being incredibly easy to miss, even if you know what you're looking for. The photos that I've seen of similar pieces of hardware show it as being just a tad bigger than one of the numbers in the date printed on the face of a United States penny. So they're pretty damn small. 
These servers were built custom for Elemental by a Taiwanese-American company called Super Micro Computer Incorporated, which is often just referred to as Super Micro. They are based in San Jose, California, and they have their headquarters in Silicon Valley, but they've got manufacturing hubs in the Netherlands, and a lot of their R&D is done in Taiwan. Super Micro is fairly well known amongst the technology set, but because they build primarily servers for businesses, unless you run a company like Amazon or a cloud backup service of some kind, you wouldn't really have had any reason to have heard of them before now. To provide a sense of scale, though, they were number 18 on Fortune Magazine's Top 100 Fastest Growing Publicly Traded Companies list in 2016, and they have a market cap of somewhere around half to three-fourths of a billion dollars, down from over two billion dollars in 2014. Amazon reported their discovery of this little chip to the U.S. authorities, and there was well-concealed panic within the intelligence community. The U.S. Department of Defense's data centers, portions of the CIA's drone operations, and the self-contained networks on U.S. Navy ships all made use of hardware from Supermicro. And they were still small potatoes compared to some of the hundreds of other customers that this company had worked with around the world. The story goes that this probe began over three years ago and is still ongoing. The probe and everything that has happened in the background is top secret, but sources in positions to know about such things have told Bloomberg that these little chips allowed attackers to access the networks to which these pieces of hardware were connected. Some of those same in-the-know people told Bloomberg that the chips had been installed in that hardware in factories run by subcontractors in mainland China. This piece then goes on to do a solid job of outlining how this type of attack would go down, what it would look like, what it would require of an attacker, and what kind of position it might put a victim in. I will link to that piece in the show notes. It is worth a read if you have about 15 minutes to really take it in. They even have an audio read aloud version on there on the website if you'd prefer to listen to this story rather than reading it. The crux of the rest of the story, though, is that China has a huge advantage when it comes to hacking modern technology because of their manufacturing capabilities and centrality when it comes to tech hardware within the global marketplace. It goes on to claim that almost 30 companies, including at least one major bank, government contractors, and Apple, were affected by this infiltration of backdoor chips on hardware. And sources identified as senior insiders at Apple have claimed that in the summer of 2015, the company actually discovered these little chips on Supermicro branded motherboards that they were using, and they ended up severing their ties with the company the following year for purportedly unrelated reasons. But Apple higher-ups knew about the insertion, these anonymous insiders claim. Amazon, which did end up acquiring Elemental in 2015, and Apple have both firmly denied having any knowledge of the claims outlined in this story, of the insertion of backdoor devices into their hardware, or of any possible espionage efforts related to hardware manipulation within their supply chain. Chinese officials released a statement indicating that supply chain safety is a concern for them, as well, indicating that they, too, have been the victim of such efforts in the past. Importantly, they didn't directly respond to allegations that these efforts might be tied to the Chinese government or their military, but they did imply very strongly that it was not them and that they are a bit pissed about these sorts of things happening as well. Part of why this is such a big story is that the portion of the supply chain in question is massive and ubiquitous. Most of us tech consumers don't ever have to interact directly with servers and other hidden back-end hardware, but those utilitarian bulk-purchased chunks of processing power and storage are what underpins many of the biggest and most popular services and companies today. Every time you use the cloud, visit a website, use an app, watch Netflix, chances are you are interacting with this sort of hardware, even if at a vast geographic distance. Another part of why this is such a big story is that it seems to support the, I think, commonly held belief, at least in the Western world, that the Chinese government is up to no good and willing to break the implied rules of cyber engagement to gain more control than they already wield. 
especially in the U.S. right now, where spook stories are told about Russia and China in particular. These stories sometimes rooted in truth, and sometimes clearly meant to amp up patriotic, isolationist sentiments. This type of report was a match tossed into a pile of dry leaves. It wasn't just inflammatory, it had a lot of readily available fuel to ignite. And one more reason this is such a big story is that Bloomberg, a very reputable news outlet, especially when it comes to business world reporting, is pitting a few dozen anonymous, ostensibly high-up sources against an array of the most powerful people in business and politics. Jeff Bezos and Tim Cook have closed ranks with the U.S. military and government establishment to say, nope, nothing weird happening here, and to very clearly and specifically indicate that what's being reported is false, often with little room to backpedal later, which is notable as these types of statements will sometimes be vague if a particular company has been legally coerced into not saying something that they might otherwise say, or if they're trying to defend their stock prices by denying that their supply chain has been messed with, knowing full well that it could be discovered at some point in the future that they told a lie. Either the people making these denials are confident that nothing new will come out to shine a light on their lies later, or they're telling the truth, which would be awkward for Bloomberg, and would also potentially play into another dominant narrative in the world of news today, that of the anonymous official making big claims, and that anonymity then being used as a cudgel against journalists and journalism as a whole, by people who want to smear the press as being untrustworthy. So let's dig into some of that a little more thoroughly. And let's start by making something very clear. Most, if not all, nation states, all governments, and some non-governmental entities, like organizations, corporations, breakaway states, terrorist groups, they all hack other groups, other governments, organizations, corporations, etc., There are countless examples of this by the U.S. government alone, to the point where it's difficult to even know where to start. But one famous, fairly recent, and quite relevant example is the CIA's interception, hacking, repackaging, and backdooring of routers sold on U.S. soil, installing software that allows them to see everything that happens on users' Wi-Fi networks. And this has been going on since 2007. That particular hack, which basically involved updating these intercepted routers' firmware to something the CIA could access whenever they liked, is called Cherry Blossom, and information about it was released to the public as part of WikiLeaks Vault 7 document dissemination, which began in 2017. Other portions of that particular leak showed that the CIA could hack cars, smart TVs, all the most popular web browsers, and the operating systems of most smartphones and computers, including iOS, Android, Windows, macOS, Linux, and so on. And the U.S. is not alone in this. Russia was recently proved to be funding ostensibly non-government connected hacker groups like Fancy Bear, which the government is then able to claim is not connected to them, even though Fancy Bear is funded and at least partially managed by the Russian intelligence agency GRU. This group has hacked government, military, and corporate entities around the world since at least the mid-2000s, at times hacking and doxing journalists at other times knocking out government infrastructure, and in some cases taking out military infrastructure, like the software controlling the D-30 howitzer artillery in Ukraine's military. Fancy Bear has also been connected to social media and phishing and malware-related attacks focused on manipulating the 2016 and 2017 German and French elections and the 2016 presidential and other subsequent elections here in the United States. A lot of China's hacking at least the pieces that we know about, involves stealing information from corporations based in other parts of the world, and then feeding that information, those trade secrets for instance, to government-connected corporations based in China. That's not the limit of their activities, of course. They are reputed to have a hacker army of somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 people. But while Russia seems to get more of a kick out of trolling other countries with fairly obvious but publicly deniable acts of sabotage and manipulation, China seems to focus on larger scale, very invisible cyber espionage infrastructure. 
And that's similar to what the US, Germany, the UK, Australia, and other large economic states do as well. Part of why is probably a confidence thing. Economically larger countries don't have much to gain from cyber espionage posturing, whereas Russia is a relatively small state with a relatively small impact on the world economy. So seeming to have outsized influence in that space can be beneficial to them. For those larger economic and governmental entities, though, being caught committing such acts can seem scandalous, almost like it's beneath them. It's generally understood that this is a burgeoning, valuable space to be invested in militarily, but it still seems somewhat sneaky and cowardly by some standards of combat. Now, a lot of that perception is based on tradition, but it says something that any accusations in this space are still met with flat-out denials and obfuscation, while more physical, confrontational attacks or maneuvers can often be acknowledged without any loss of face in the international community. It makes sense that something like cyber espionage would increase in popularity now, though, as we live in a world which, at least for the time being, is almost always friendly to sovereignty and borders and the stated right of other nations to exist. That's been the case since World War II, and it's a key aspect of why the world has been so peaceful relative to the rest of human history for the past six or seven decades. And it's not a right that is universally applied by the organizations that connect the couple hundred governments that exist today. The wealthier countries definitely stomp around and decide which countries are real by their standards and which can be casually cast aside and invaded and bullied and so on. But compared to the state of affairs pre-World War II, and even more so pre Peace of Westphalia, which was the beginning of the modern international system, and says, in short, that countries should not invade other countries, which was something that happened with remarkable frequency throughout history up until that point. But that modern state of affairs, blended with the increased ubiquity of networks, of the internet and apps and smartphones and software, and software in everything connected to software and everything else, means that there are potentially vast resources available if you trade your highwaymen for information superhighwaymen. And those who invest in state-supported hacking will likely be more prepared for the next big war, if one ever comes. Because a whole lot of the enemy's forces and infrastructure will be reliant on these types of networks and software and hardware. So there are short-term and long-term benefits to making investments in cyber espionage at various levels. Part of why it's so difficult to say whether or not this hack even happened, and the majority of the cybersecurity world seems to have come down on the side of Apple and Amazon here, saying that it would be a silly way to hack someone, since software, not hardware, is the cheaper, better, more reliable way to hack, and it would be less likely to be noticed as well. But part of why we don't know if this is even a real thing is because of the ever-present veil of secrecy that exists within elite hacking units working for governments around the world, which is something that we know exists, but we know shockingly little about compared to what we know about the traditional wings of our militaries. But add to that the paranoia and secrecy and cautiousness of the corporations involved, and that obfuscation is amplified further. These corporations are entities that, in some cases, have resources, especially human resources, rivaling those of many governments. This setup means that not only are there legit top-secret documents in play, but there are corporate guardians trying to protect their jobs, their stocks, their retirement plans. We've got government and private enterprise working together to keep things quiet, and that is a potent combination if you are looking to keep a secret even if that particular secret is already out in the open. As an interesting side note, it is legal for governments to hack each other because governments set the rules by which they abide, and they can usually obfuscate their way out of being punished according to international guidelines. In a lot of cases, organizations like the United Nations care more about keeping countries involved in the organization than leveling punishments that might cause those nations to quit, to separate. So they are more likely to let hackers that are caught red-handed off the hook if those hackers can be connected to a government entity that is part of their number, which is almost all the countries in the world at this point. What's more, the five countries that make up the UN Security Council, China, France, the UK, the US, and Russia, 
all have veto power over pretty much anything that happens within that hallowed body. So if someone were to, for instance, try to hold Russia accountable for annexing Crimea, which is a euphemism for invading and conquering it, with Russian soldiers not wearing Russian flags on their uniforms, then Russia can veto that measure and get away with it. No punishment, no official scar on their record. If a company like Microsoft or Apple were to counterhack China for messing with them, though, that could get them in serious trouble. Yes, corporations have a great deal of power, especially in places like the United States, but that power ends, with few exceptions, when it comes to physical force or international espionage, including cyber espionage. Though they do seem to get away with espionage against other corporations some of the time. Let's move on to that final point that I mentioned earlier, the anonymous source aspect of this story. At the moment, there are many people who find it convenient to paint the free press as an enemy of society. A good heuristic, a good mental shortcut for this, is that when someone tells you that the press is the enemy, it almost always means that that person believes the press is a threat to them personally. And seeing as how it's the press's job to report truth, to present data to democratic societies, that almost always means that the person who is demonizing them has skeletons in their closet that they are trying to hide. There are exceptions to this, of course, and not all journalists are journalists in the sense of reporting important information to the voting public. I would argue that TMZ-style journalists, folks looking for gossip in the entertainment world, can go either way. In some cases, you unearth Harvey Weinstein-esque scandals, but a lot of the time you're just playing the entertainment world game, fluffing up certain people and tearing others down, harassing them and their families for clicks. Journalism in a very loose sense, but only kinda sorta most of the time. The vast majority of people operating in this industry, though, despite, quite often, they're receiving very small paychecks and being on the business end of immense pushback from people in power, they are doing their best to educate the public, to be a check on those who would abuse their positions, and to ensure that we are all able to make better informed choices about who we put in charge, about what we buy, and about how we live our lives. The current pushback is an extension of that, of how things have always been, but with some very serious, vocal, powerful people parroting those same familiar anti-journalism lines from their positions of authority. Donald Trump is not the only authoritarian-leaning leader in the world today, and these people, along with those in the heavily slanted, politically captured, borderline propaganda-spewing media companies that support these people's rise to power, they make their money and accrue leverage by smearing anyone who might call them out on their abuses or flaws or mistakes. We should all seek out unbiased third-party information, especially about people we support, to make sure that we have the straight dope on these things. Unfortunately, many of our media ecosystems provide the opposite. They spoon-feed us more of what we want to hear, so we feel good about already having the right answers and opinions, rather than being challenged to accept that our chosen party, politician, celebrity, or whomever else might be flawed in important ways that we should know about. Right now, in the U.S., but again, this is also happening elsewhere, with other elections, with other seated leaders, there are a lot of leaks with insiders trying to make important information known to the public so that they will be informed and hopefully make better decisions based on that information. But many of these leakers, these informants, are choosing to remain anonymous. In some cases to protect their jobs, in others to protect their families, to protect their lives. All of which makes sense. A lot of leakers, even if they leak vitally important socially valuable information, end up being exiled by their own government or imprisoned for life, or doxxed and pursued by critics, on the run from that point forward, unable to get hired by anyone, anywhere in the world, or in some cases they're even killed, the victims of convenient, thinly veiled accidents. This story has a lot of anonymous sources, and very, very few named sources. What that means is that the Bloomberg Newsweek board got the names of the sources from the reporters who did the investigation. They looked into them. They did their due diligence. They checked the facts. And they determined that these sources were credible and legitimate enough to run with them. 
Anonymous does not mean we are making this up. It means we are concealing the identity of the person who gave us this information, because the consequences for that person, if they are named, could be quite serious. That, though, does not always help the perceived credibility of stories that have mostly or entirely unnamed sources. In this case, the combined certitude of these big corporations and governments innately feel a lot more credible than the staff at Bloomberg. No matter how well-researched the piece, and no matter how good their work has been before, it just seems like an imbalance, doesn't it? It's not how most of us outside the world of journalism do things, especially in a world filled with bots and fake reviews and phishing attempts. It's difficult to trust anyone that we cannot Google stock and assess for legitimacy. A lot of the hot take editorial world seems to agree with that sentiment coming down hard against the chances that this story ends up being real, or at the very least that it ends up being as groundbreaking and widespread as it initially seemed to be. That said, there is still a solid chance that these sources are real, the story is true, or mostly true, and the government and corporate people answering the questions either don't know what they don't know, or they have what they consider to be a good reason to conceal it, there's a very good chance, in my mind, and in the minds of a lot of people who know a great deal more about the world of cybersecurity than I do, and who have written about this case, that there's an active counter-espionage effort going on right now. And both the government and these companies are keeping mum about it, because to give anything away would maybe short-circuit those efforts. It would keep them from sealing up all the back doors, or from getting revenge, or both. There's also a chance that the government will keep the lid clamped down on this thing either way, since it is labeled top secret and no one should be talking about it in public. And they will leverage laws that they've got on the books to keep tech companies from saying anything about it ever, even if it comes out later someday that Tim Cook and Jeff Bezos lied to us about what they knew. Based on all of that, they could just say, hey, they threatened us, nothing we could do. And that would probably be a sufficient, understandable enough answer for most of us. I mean, what are these companies going to do? What are these CEOs going to do? Put their status with the government on the line? Their ability to legally operate within the US? Put that in jeopardy? Just to try to back up the credibility of some journalists that are working for a publication that doesn't always write nice things about them to begin with? Probably not. That would not be, from some perspectives, in the best interest of the country, or arguably in the best interest of their shareholders. But that, of course, like every aspect of this story, is a highly debatable position to take. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. You can also contribute monetarily via Venmo and PayPal and things like that at let's know things.com. And if you're looking to support the show non-monetarily, a very valuable way to do so is to leave a quick review up on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and or to share the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it or with your social network of choice. All methods of support and contribution, monetary or non-monetary, whatever shape they take, are very much appreciated. Thank you very much. The podcast that I'd like to recommend today is called The Dream, and this is a podcast that is kind of about pyramid schemes, but it's actually more focused on the legal version, or at least currently legal version, of pyramid schemes, which are called multi-level marketing businesses. And the only real distinction between pyramid schemes and MLM businesses is that one is legal and the other is not, and MLM businesses have a product involved in their business model. Though in a lot of cases, the most lucrative way to operate within these businesses is not to sell the products, but instead to get a bunch of other people to join after you joined, and then convince them to buy a lot of products to sell or to themselves bring even more people into the fold, which creates, as you might imagine, a pyramid-shaped diagram of people entering into this scam. And this podcast is fun. It takes an interesting approach to this. It talks about the history of it and why these things are scams and horrible, and in my opinion should be illegal. But they interweave that information with 
actually joining up with one of these MLM businesses and showing what's involved and what the step-by-step process of joining one and becoming part of one of these groups looks like and the types of manipulations that they've integrated into that community to make them vaguely cult-like in some cases, but bare minimum to create a situation where people have trouble getting out of them if and when they choose to do so. It's a very good listen with some very good information involved. If you're looking for an interesting podcast to supplement your feed with, consider checking out The Dream. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find my podcast at exilelifestyle.com, and you can find the show notes for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsnotethings.com. You can find out more information about the tour that I am currently on at becomingtour.com, and feel free to reach out and say hello on your social network of choice. I am at Colin is my name on most of those. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you.